Hi there. In this video, I am going to be talking about grid search. And specifically, I'll be talking about ways to speed it up. And it's good to consider speed ups because grid search can get slow quite quickly. Let's consider this uh, pipeline just for illustrative purposes. This pipeline has an estimator at the end and it has two transformers uh, that happened before. And for each of these components in the pipeline, we might have some parameters that we just want to try out. Uh, let's say that we have uh, four settings we'd like to try here, maybe another five here, and uh, let's say we've got another two here. Well then, uh, we can go ahead and multiply all these numbers together and uh, come to the conclusion that we got to try 40 different settings uh, for this one pipeline. The grid search object in scikit-learn can totally do that on our behalf, but inside of grid search, we are typically also doing cross-validation. Suppose that we are running five-fold validation, that would mean that uh, we are cutting up our data set into five segments, and then each segment will be a validation set at some point, but it also means that if we are running uh, five cross-validations, well, then we can multiply this number again. Without having a grid that's super big, we already end up with a pipeline that needs to train 200 times in order to run this grid search. And this is a common thing. Grid search can explode if you're not careful. So it's good to consider things that you can do to speed this up, such as you're not wasting compute needlessly. And as we'll see in the video, there's a couple of tricks that we can use, but in particular, there is a caching trick uh, that deserves to get just a little bit of extra recognition. So that is something I'm going to uh, zoom in on uh, right now. All right, uh, I am back in my Jupyter notebook and I've got this data set in front of me just as a semi-motivating example. Uh, it is the Google Emotions data set and it just contains uh, some texts uh, with a label for an emotion uh, that is or is not uh, in this text. So uh, this is a column with uh, ones and zeros and this is a column with uh, texts. There's a lot that could be said about this data set, uh, but for now, the main thing that's important is that for uh, scikit-learn purposes, um, I need my inputs for my pipeline. So I've got my uh, X and my Y variable over here. Uh, this is the input to the model. This is the thing that we'll be predicting. So given that I have such a data set, uh, the next thing I can do is I can pass that into a pipeline. Uh, and here's one that I've defined. And it might be good to go through uh, all the different components here. So this is a pipeline where uh, text would go in and then this first component, this uh, TFIDF vectorizer over here, that will take that text and turn it into a sparse vector. The TFIDF vectorizer is very similar to the count vectorizer. It just adds weights uh, to words that appear more or less often. But the main thing for now is that we just have our uh, sparse representation here. Then this sparse representation is passed to this uh, truncated SVD component, and that will turn it into a dense array. It does this using a factorization technique internally. The details of that are not important to this video. But one thing that is relevant is that there is a hyperparameter uh, to this component that you can set. And that hyperparameter uh, determines how wide this dense layer is going to be. As you can imagine, this sparse array over here is very, very wide because we might have a column for every word that appears, but this representation is going to be much more thin and uh, how thin is something that we can control using this uh, number of components parameter. It functions very similarly to a PCA or principal component analysis, if you've seen that before. That said, uh, given that we now have a dense representation, we can now pass that to the final model at the end over here. This is where we're actually going to be uh, learning from the data, so to say. This is where we uh, make a model that can uh, do something predictive. But this model will also have a parameter. In this particular case, there is a uh, regularization uh, parameter, uh, C. You can check the docs for the details. But for our purposes, uh, with regards to grid search, the main thing that's just important is that we have something uh, in this transformer over here that uh, we might want to grid search over. That's this number of components. Uh, and we've got something over here in our final estimator uh, that will be this uh, regularization parameter, so to say. Now, just a quick tip. Um, if you are interested in performing a grid search, one thing that you probably want to do 
is you want to take your pipeline and use this get params method because this is going to give you uh, all the different parameters that you can set in this pipeline. You can see over here, for example, that I have a tfidf vectorizer underscore analyzer uh, parameter over here. This tfidf vectorizer refers to uh, the name of this component, which has been automatically generated by this make pipeline function. And this analyzer over here refers to a parameter that you can set. Um, so just uh, for good measure, you can actually inspect uh, this component and we can confirm that analyzer is indeed something that we can set. So all the different items that you could set are listed here. In layman's terms, what that basically means is that you uh, really just have to look for the item of interest and make sure you copy this because this string is something that you can then go ahead and use in your grid search. Um, it's just a little habit of mine to uh, always use this get params when I'm building a grid search uh, because it automatically makes sure that I uh, get what I want. Anyway, long story short, uh, I have my pipeline, uh, there are components in it, uh, and I have a parameter grid over here uh, inside of my grid search that contains parameters uh, of these components that I would like to uh, evaluate. So for logistic regression, uh, I have this uh, parameter C, uh, that will be a parameter in this component. And I have some values that I would like to check between 0 0.01 and 2. And uh, this parameter might benefit from a log scale, uh, which is why I'm uh, sampling through NP log space. But this uh, truncated SVD uh, has a number of components uh, attribute, hence, again, this name. Um, and I'm just checking a couple of uh, component numbers, so to say. I'm also doing cross-validation five times. So uh, just to do a little bit of math, I have uh, five different values here. I have four different values here. I'm cross-validating five times. So this would be 20 different parameters uh, times five cross-validations. So that means that in total, uh, this pipeline over here is going to be refitted uh, 100 times. So even though in total, I'm just checking uh, five values here and four values there, uh, already this uh, is a bunch of computation that needs to happen. So let's see how long it actually takes uh, to run all that. So uh, what I'll do now is I'll run this uh, grid.fit method over here. And I'm using this double percentage sign uh, time magic over here. That's a Jupyter specific decorator, I guess you could say, to the cell. Uh, and this is just going to track how long uh, this uh, fitting command takes. And this will actually take a while. So I'm going to grab a glass of water in the meantime. Right, so uh, it is now done, and this command in total took just over four minutes. Now, that's not a huge amount of time to wait for a grid search, but at the same time, uh, there's a bunch of things we can do to speed this up. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, do some good things here. The first thing that I'll do is I'm going to set this refit uh, parameter to false. Now, this is a relatively minor thing, but it is something that will speed it up for our purposes because uh, the normal assumption that's inside of this grid search over here is that once we have tried every single uh, hyperparameter, then we might be interested in just fitting the best model on the entire data set. So what it will then do is it will just grab the best parameters and then refit this entire pipeline using those parameters on this entire X and this entire why? Without any cross-validation. So technically it is refitting one extra model at the end. If we're just interested in running the grid search for research purposes though, then uh, that's a little bit of compute that doesn't need to happen. So for that use case, uh, feel free to set refit to false here. If you're just interested in measuring, uh, you're not going to need this. However, something that might make more of an impact, and that's relatively simple to configure, is this number of jobs parameter. This will allow me to uh, set the level of parallelism. That is to say, I could tell it to you uh, try to train two pipelines in parallel. This is definitely a nice parameter because training these different pipelines is something that's embarrassingly parallel. It's not like processes have to communicate with each other. Uh, we just have to copy the data, put that in a new pipeline, and that's something that can totally run uh, next to each other. Uh, the most convenient setting usually for this is to set number of jobs to uh, minus one because this is just going to grab all the available compute resources uh, that it can. The internals of scikit-learn will figure out how many CPUs are available and that sort of a thing. 
Um, so let's see uh, what changes when um, we run this instead. And again, after waiting a bit, we can definitely see a bit of a speed up. So in this case, uh, it's no longer over four minutes, it's uh, much closer to one minute. Now, you might be surprised to know that the machine that I currently have has eight CPUs on it. And with that in mind, you might expect that we don't see a 4x decrease, we might expect an eight times decrease in compute time needed. One thing to remember is that even though we are trying to run things as parallel as possible, there is always going to be a little bit of overhead. And especially in my case, uh, I'm running this on a machine that is also running other software. In particular, there is some uh, video recording software that's running that's probably a culprit. But odds are that there are other programs in general running on a machine, such that in general you cannot expect 100% uh, compute resources being allocated efficiently. But anyway, uh, we do see that if we throw more compute at the problem, that then the problem runs faster. So in a way, that's fine. But there's also some compute that's just uh, wasteful, and uh, that's something that we should address maybe first. And here's what I mean by that. Let's say that I'm training a new uh, system for uh, cross-validation set 1. So I've got my x1 and y1, so to say. Well then, um, first my data will go through this component, uh, then through this one, and then through this one. And typically at each component, uh, there will be a fit step where uh, we are learning something from the data. Now it depends a bit on the component. Uh, not every component will be super compute intensive, but some components that are compute intensive are going to incur this fit step every single time. And if we do that for every single data step that we get in via cross-validation, then I can argue that might be fine. But it would be a shame if we learn something here and that we would then have to retrain that segment for everything that we do later. And in particular, I'm thinking about the hyperparameters that I have here in my logistic regression. If the TF IDF vectorizer has trained for a specific data set, and if the truncated SVD has been trained, then I don't see the need to retrain them whenever I have a new logistic regression parameter. But in this base setting that I have over here, that I'm where I'm running everything in parallel, that's exactly what is happening. So instead of just blindly rerunning this entire pipeline every single time, Maybe instead what we want to do is we want to cache these components somehow. We want to sort of store them in a database of sorts just so they can be retrieved later. Uh, and as luck would have it, it turns out that uh, Joblib, which is the library that scikit-learn depends on, uh, actually has uh, such a cache implemented. It will use your disk as a cache, but in order to configure this, uh, we are going to have to make one small change uh, to the pipeline object. Now this bit might come across as slightly unintuitive because you might think that if you want to speed up this grid search uh, that you might have to insert some input parameter uh, to it down here. But in this case, if we want to apply proper caching, uh, we would have to add a memory param to the constructor of the pipeline over here. Now what I can do is I can say, uh, let's give it a name. So we're going to call it the, the cache demo, so to say, and then by adding the memory over here, we are going to add a folder on disk called cache demo, where all sorts of hashed inputs to these components are going to be stored with some metadata as well as their uh, pickled representation. In layman's terms though, that basically means that for different inputs and different configurations, we are just going to uh, store all these separate components uh, in this pipeline. That is to say, we're going to store everything except for this final step over here, uh, because this final step will always need to be retrained. But we are going to cache everything before the final step. So uh, we have our updated pipeline over here, so that's good. Uh, let's run this grid search one more time with this new pipeline uh, to see what kind of speed up we get. And boom! We now have about 25 seconds, which definitely feels like a good speed up again. Now, one thing that might be fun to do is you can actually inspect this cache demo uh, folder uh, to see what's inside of it. And when you do that, you're going to see joblib, scikit-learn, pipeline, there's a bunch of folders before you get to the good stuff. But at some point, you're going to get all these folders that seem to contain a hash. 
And if you look around these folders, you'll notice that uh, some of these folders with a hash have this uh, pickle file that's stored. That will be a trained uh, scikit-learn component that could be loaded. But there are these other folders that contain uh, some metadata. And this is also interesting to look at, but this just contains a function signature, which is also needed to uh, reconstruct what's happening in this pipeline over here. But anyway, the main thing to remember at this point is that you can add a caching mechanism uh, to a pipeline, and that can really speed up your training runs when you're doing a proper grid search. The one caveat I do want to add to this is that your mileage might certainly vary uh, depending on the components that you're using. In this demo over here, I'm using truncated SVD, which is a relatively compute intensive component. There's definitely some math that has to run in order to uh, calculate this. And that's also why I'm not that surprised that we see a pretty good speed up down here. But if you are dealing with components where we're not really doing too much math going in, uh, but we are dealing with large matrices that go in, then there is also some overhead. If we have a component, then we're going to have to hash that, and that's going to be hashed based on the input going in, as well as the parameters that go in. But you can imagine, if we have uh, a data set going into this component that's very big, uh, calculating the hash for that component is also going to be quite expensive, but we do need some sort of hash in order to uh, store this component on disk. This hash serves as an identifier, and the most reliable way to have such an identifier is to hash the input proper. For large data sets, this is also a computational burden. So again, even though I do think that this caching mechanism is something that's underappreciated and definitely can be considered more often, the speed up you'll get uh, does depend a little bit on your setup. If you've never used it before though, uh, definitely give this a spin right now.